when it comes to life, it's dormant and then suddenly My manager called an agent and said, you're not gonna believe this, they wanna test you for Knight Rider. I said, what's Knight Rider? They said, uh, show about a talking car. I said, oh, wow. Send out a script over, they sent the script over, I read the script and I, honest to God, said, wow, this is unbelievable. It was like glowing in my hands. I was going, this is gold. I didn't pick him out of a crowd and say, it's David. We, we interviewed a lot of people, and I think a lot of people read, but then we narrowed it down to five people, and we did screen tests on them, uh, on film. This is my ticket. This is sent to me from God. This is it. I totally believed it. And I called my father, and I said, Dad, I'm testing for a show called Knight Rider. So I thought you were going to New York. Well, I was, but this, this is a prime time show on NBC. It's gonna be huge. What's it about? I said, it's about a talking car. And my dad said, I think you should go to New York. But um, I got my star. I saw the new Pontiac that was just coming out. I really thought it was it had great lines, especially for an American car. They took the first two cars off of the assembly line and shipped them to us. That's what we had to make the pilot. My first day was um, a bit of a comedy of errors. I had a very upset stomach and had a, my, had a, it was a bad day. I was in the restroom a lot and, uh, and um, you know, there's, there's some things I could, I, that I just can't tell you. What's going on? What do I do? Deny everything. The pilot episode really establishes everything, and you get to see Glenn Larson's original vision of the show. I mean, I love the things where the cops see him driving by, and he's asleep, and um, breaking in and out of jail, and, you know, I mean, I sort of like big theatrical things. But it's just bouncing off that windshield. <laughs> Music was really important. It really set the tone. There are all ways that producers influence the composer on uh, on what he's writing, and in this particular case, Glenn has a little more input than uh, others because of his uh, musical ability. And I sat down with Stu, and we put that theme underneath the uh, show and used it throughout the show, and uh, it did catch on. It. To this day, I mean, I've got it on my telephone as the answering machine, so every time the phone rings, it goes dun, 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 dun. Michael, what shall I do while you're gone? You're on vacation too, kid. Get some sun. For us, Kit was always a cast member. He was always part of the show. We always talked of him as, you know, if he could talk. Kit? Yes? Shut up. And you would be surprised at how many crew members came walking over and said, oh, I want to hear Kit talk. Let's hear Kit talk. And you're going, guys, it's an actor in the studio that does the talking. The car doesn't talk. Kit stayed in makeup way too long, and you know, and he was just really a pest. It was awful. You know, for a collection of microprocessors, you're awfully touchy. Wrong. It's just that my circuits function better when we operate in a reality mode. Kit? Yes, Michael. Just keep driving. You never get him out of the shop. He was always getting like tuned up or polished. Sometimes he would just drive off and have to be by himself. Kit, you okay? Kit! We'll discuss that at a more appropriate time. I never had any other voice in mind when I was writing it and when I went to cast it. I mean, what he really sold was this sort of prissiness and, uh, you know, pedantic. Here are guys doing comedy. And of course, a guy who's just a voice is not gonna be sitting on the set when you're doing the scene. The script girl will read his lines. You know, Michael, Michael, wake up. Okay, so you'll have a script girl's voice in there until you get to the dubbing stage, and then Bill will have come in and said his lines, and they put them together. They didn't meet for six months. They met at the Christmas party. He says, hi, I'm William Daniels. I play Kit. I said, hi, I'm David Hasselhoff. I play Michael. And we just started laughing. I said, we got a hit. He goes, yes, we do. Just remember, this is business, not pleasure. You're about as much fun as a divorce, which is not a bad idea. I want custody of me. You know, I should have gotten rid of you before I turned you on. Now I can't shut you up. Hi, ladies. We got a comedy team there. 
uh, a lot of natural conflict. You know, what hero wants to be dependent on the car? Michael had a chance to teach Kit what, what emotion was, what the human side was. So I started calling the car, buddy. How you doing, buddy? How you doing, pal? You know, because I said, this is, I mean, this is, you know, I'm the Lone Ranger, and this is Silver. I'm Roy Rogers, and this is Trigger. How's it feel to be one of a kind again? As you know, Michael, I do not have feelings. However, for want of a better expression, being one of a kind is a very familiar feeling. Right. Good night, buddy. Michael, you do realize this race is academic, not to mention unnecessary. Why is that? The car of the future is already here. Me. <laughs> it was work only when you were sitting in the car in July wearing a leather jacket with the windows up, and it was about 110 degrees in there. You know, it was a tough shoot. He had cars, he had stunts that were really dangerous. We just knew that we had a car that could do anything, and, you know, what do we do with a car that can do anything? I mean, anything that we could dream up, we would put on the dash of Kit to show. In the very first episode, it was established that Kit was basically indestructible, could jump, use the turbo boost. As the season progressed, you see things like a microwave jammer, a grappling hook, oil slick, and a tracking scope. It was fun for us to say, OK, here's the monitors. We had two monitors in it. And those monitors, we could put in anything we wanted. It was primarily Mike Chaffe. It would be the, the genius behind you know, all of the final design on the car. And he's the one that came up with all these LEDs and all of the things that hadn't been on any cars at that time. The fans of the show were going to their local Pontiac dealerships and asking for a Trans Am that looked like Kit with the scanner and with the front nose and the dashboard. Pontiac then went to the producers and said, please don't refer to this car as a Trans Am anymore. Not that you can't tell it's a Trans Am anyways. What do you say we pay the general a little visit, huh? Is this a car or a spaceship? A little bit of both. OK, now we've got to have a bad guy. Somewhere in each episode, there's going to be some kind of bad entity. And so we always kind of, you know, made fun of the fact that what is the bad entity this episode? Is it going to be a bulldozer? Is it going to be an airplane? Is it going to be, you know, a car crusher? It can be something, but it's going to be really bad. Kit, they're still shooting at us. Thank you, Michael, but I noticed that myself. Lots of fire, lots of special effects, lots of explosions. You know, when you went to work, you knew you were in for an experience that day. You would, you'd go, you'd get up at 4.30, and you'd stumble home at 8. Beat. Oh, yes, a typical Michael Knight situation. Total confusion, mass destruction, all in a good cause, of course. If you have a show that uh, you say is sort of nonsense, fantasy, whatever, the best thing you can do uh, is hire the best possible actors. Edward Mulher, hello, darling. It's absolutely unbelievable. And Michael's quite certain of this. I am, sir. Would you like me to give you a 40-point cross-indexed statistical readout? Good Lord, no, it's 2 AM. Edward brought the show dignity. He brought it, uh, that, that touch of class. He just popped into my head one day. I said, if, he could, if he'd do it, we want him. I was always fighting the dialogue because they always had to tell the story, you know. There's a, uh, Michael, there are these bad people that are taking these weapons and they're really bad and you must do this and you go there. And he had all this jargon to say that was like so long, thank God I didn't have it. And he used to go, oh, and he gets so frustrated. Devin, don't let anyone tell you differently. You are a little strange. This is a game of gentlemen, of serenity. Of Charles II and Samuel Pepys. Know them. Edward became really like my, my second father, and uh, we played that like on the show. You know, like there was a amazing amount of respect, but Michael was always giving him something. That's how it was on the set. We were always setting Edward up. He was uh, quite gullible. Hello, you two. Hi, Devin. Bonnie, is Kit fully prepared? Yes, sir. We uh, always liked the relationship that they had created for Michael and Patricia because Michael kind of secretly liked Patricia, but she and she, she secretly liked Michael, but uh, she couldn't show it because she was the, the brains. And uh, Michael was uh, too much of a guy to let his feelings, uh, you know, surface for her. But secretly, there was a kind of a twinkle in, in his eye for her. And uh, Patricia McPherson was quite a part of the success of the show, even to the very end. People always talk about Bonnie. Right now, there's only one thing wrong with this car. I know. 
the nut, nut behind, behind the wheel. wheel. That's that's very funny. Very funny. You know, Michael Knight was basically uh, King Arthur in, in Camelot. You know, it was the Knights of the Round Table. I wanted, my influence was, I didn't want to be the White Knight, I wanted to be the Black Knight. Because I said, Black Knight's cool, man. And then I wanted the show to have a lot of heart. I said, we've got to do shows that touch people's heart. And so we sat down with an idea that uh, Michael had been engaged to be married. And he sees this girl, and his mind just kind of flashes back into, oh my gosh, this is, the woman, but he can't tell her. He had someone that he loved and he lost, and now he was trying to get her back, but he couldn't tell her that he was really Michael Knight. Catherine Hicklin guest starred in White Bird, which at the time was David Hasselhoff's fiance. It took me a long time to sell everybody on it. I said, guys, she's an actress and she's beautiful, and you know, let's do it. I'm Devin Miles, and you are Stephanie Mason. Yes. How do you do? It made for a really, really good episode at the time. All right. Might as well deal with this now. Kit, say hello to Stephanie. Stephanie, meet my car, Kit. I think he feels that there's a void there, and he needs to go out and just meet all these other women. But I mean, if you have a talking car, and that's, that's a good icebreaker. Well, yeah, he was a knight in shining armor, so we had to find somebody who was in distress, you know? And I think the most fun shows were the ones where he kind of got the girls. Hi, I'm Michael Knight, yeah, the new driver. He kind of knew that if you fall in love with Michael, she either goes away or she dies, you know? So it's kind of like, you don't want to mess with Michael Knight <laughs> because he's going to drive away with Kit. Michael, why do you need to socialize with so many women? Wouldn't one be sufficient? Kit, you're beginning to sound like my mother here. I mean, what's wrong with the little companionship? Michael, I'm getting some unusual readings. Readings of what? I am the Knight Automated Roving Robot. Car, if you prefer. The only difference between Kit and Car are their main program. Kit's is to preserve human life, and Car's is self-preservation. Somebody's behind us. Yes, I see. It is the inferior production line. Copy. Car was was a place where we could really expand on on the you know an evil part to it. This car supposedly cannot be destroyed, so how do you stop something that can't be destroyed? Now we could have the car do things that Kit would never do, you know, and attack people and try and run over things, because that's what Carr would do. He's in destruction mode. He's going to run through everything we can think of. You are mistaken. I am Carr, you know, and it was like Kit meets his nemesis. It was like Jekyll and Hyde. It was awesome. I am the prototype of the car of the future. What you saw was merely an inferior production line model. The other highlight of the first season was Chariot of Gold, just because if the characters were out of place, Kit's programming was altered and he tried to kill Michael. Bonnie was brainwashed and she tried to kill Michael and he was left to figure everything out and save the day. No, Kit, you're mine. I have my orders. You're my car, kid. We all kind of grew together, and by the time we got to the last few episodes of Knight Rider, we had felt like we all had gotten from A to B, that we had really progressed to a point where we felt like we'd really accomplished something. I just sat back and enjoyed it. You know, it was a great ride. Everybody on that cast and crew had a blast. If you ask anybody who worked on that show, they said it was a, would be the greatest time of their lives. And I think that's why Knight Rider worked, is it was because Michael Knight and Kit had a relationship. They were best friends. And everybody in the world wanted to sit next to me and hang out. Oh yeah, the car talks. I'd explain it. But it's like your relationship with your father. It's very complicated. And the theme of Knight Rider is one man can make a difference. One person can make a difference. You can make a difference in someone's life and you can make a difference in your own life. And uh, that's what Night Rider is about. Tonight, Night Rider, the two-hour movie spectacular crashes into your living room. I don't believe this. Well, you'd better believe it. A lone crusader for justice drives this crime crasher. The world's most fantastic car. And together they can do just about anything. After all, we're only human. Don't press your luck. <laughs> And now, buckle up for action with the fastest show on television, Knight Rider, the movie.